All right, so the Texicurians are here at the French Legation in Austin, Texas, and I'm here with Kyle Walker, who is the outreach specialist, and he's just gonna tell us a little bit more about the French Legation. So Kyle? Yeah. So can you give us the background of like just what the French Legation is and what they do and the historic site itself? Yeah, so this is Austin's oldest recorded residence. Now, we use that term recorded residence because there is one other building. It's got a claim to fame to being as old, built in the year 18 or finished in the year 1841. But we have more documented evidence. We know this building was begun in late 1840. It was completed in late winter, early spring of 1841. So it's coming up on its 181st birthday, essentially at the end of February, beginning of March. So this, home, this building was built to be the home for the French representative to the Republic of Texas, Monsieur Jean-Pierre Isidore Alphonse Dubois. You might see his An name awful. mentioned, <laughs> yes. You might see his name mentioned also with the de Saligny, an official uh, noble title. Um, that is not his actual name. You might see it on markers, you might see it in books. When he came to Texas, he gave himself a noble title, uh, trying to trick the pioneers here into thinking he was from a more noble birth. And since none of them were actually from France, who were they to know any different? And he got away with it for many, many years. In fact, many historians actually throughout the early 20th century kept recording his name as that official title, de Saligny. However, here at the French Legation, we want to give a more accurate representation of his time here in Austin. Mm -hmm. So we just refer to him as Alphonse Dubois. This was built to be his home. Uh, he paid for it with his own money, uh, out of his own pocket. It was not paid for by the nation of France or the French taxpayers. Uh, when he first came to Austin, he lived in uh, an inn at the corner of 6th and Congress Avenue for a few weeks before moving into a rental house at what's now 6th and Guadalupe Street, or Pecan Street and Guadalupe Street back then. When he was in that house, and we use that term house lightly, it was more of like a, a, a cabin, really. It wasn't a log cabin, more of a shanty cabin. Uh, he got an idea to uh, commission a grander, more elegant residence where he could wine and dine the politicians and political elite of Texas in a much more comfortable setting. So he purchased 21.5 acres outside of the original downtown plan of Austin, up here on what was then known as Pleasant Hill, and commissioned Thomas William Ward, a famous Texas builder and revolutionary veteran, to build this house for him. It's designed in a French Creole cottage style. Thomas Ward was a trained builder from the city of New Orleans before he came to Texas. So you'll notice a lot of uh, French Creole influences in the site. It fit very well to Dubois' tastes. He also liked to spend a lot of time in New Orleans instead of actually here in Austin, so that also fit very well with the scene as well. But even though it's known as the French Legation, Dubois never lived here. Uh, he paid for this house, he bought the land, he commissioned it, but before it was finished and he could move in, he actually left town. He got in one too many disputes with the locals, and, in, and especially in an incident known as the Pig War. And he decided he had had it with frontier life and all these rough and tumble American pioneers out here on what would have been the edge of the world to him. And he just left Texas altogether. He went to go live and work in the city of New Orleans, where he liked to spend a lot of time, where he could speak French and wine and dine in a much more comfortable setting. And he never actually stayed in the house that he paid to build up here on this hilltop. Emily, would you like to go inside and check it out? Yeah, let's All go right, see. let's go. Thanks. So walk around? Yeah, well, first room is right here. Okay. It's kind of the order we have on the tour. This room is all about Dubois' time in office. Now, unlike the previous um, group that ran the site, we don't have it as a regular house museum of what you would think, filled with a bunch of antique furniture that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. What furniture we do have is the furniture that is historic to the site itself for the folks that actually lived and worked here. So this chair and this sofa are actually part of Dubois' original furniture collection. Wow. He purchased it in New Orleans in 1840 before he came to move to the new capital city of Austin, which had been founded the year before. It looks brand new. <laughs> <laughs> it's been restored several times. Oh, yeah. So this stuff is original to this home. Now, it might not have actually been used in this building. Remember, Dubois did live in a rental house or a mm -hmm. cabin in West Austin. Okay. He never actually lived in this house, so we're not exactly sure uh, if this furniture was ever in this building before the 1950s. Mm -hmm. However, we do know of its origins because when Dubois left town, he sold this furniture to other prominent Austinites, and it was passed down through their family members. And by the early 20th century, when that women's group, the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, was operating their museum inside the old land office off the Capitol grounds, Someone approached them with the actual bill of sale and receipt from the 1850s, the most recent one they had, of this furniture, claiming its provenance to have come from Dubois a decade earlier. Wow. And so that's how I know of its origins. 
That's amazing. There are still two more pieces of furniture from his furniture collection in existence. Unfortunately, this table is not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are inside the governor's mansion, upstairs in the bedroom named after Sam Houston. Oh. In much the same way, those were donated to the group that runs the furniture collection for that site mm -hmm. sometime in the 20th century. But we're hoping maybe we can get, get it here as part of a traveling exhibition and reunite all of Dubois' furniture under one roof for the first time in almost 200 years. That'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and what's this room over here? This room right here is all about the time after Dubois. So when Dubois sells the house in December of 1840, he only purchased the property in September of 1840, turned right around and sold the house just as it had begun in December of 1840 mm -hmm. to the Catholic Church. And another Frenchman, Father Jean-Marie Audin, and his counterpart, Irish priest, Father Timon. Now, they had been sent to Texas to rebuild the faith in the New Republic, and they were in the new capital city to request that some of those Spanish missions, especially the ones around San Antonio, be transferred from the Republic of Texas back to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So they were in the new capital city to meet with the new government and, the, uh, and everything. And naturally, if there's another Frenchman running around town, they're probably going to bump into each other, right? You know, Austin's not that big, and there's only a handful of Frenchmen running around out here on the frontier. So Father Odin attended a few of uh, Dubois' dinner parties, and that's where Dubois gets the idea to not only help them out with their legislation, but also sell the house to Odin and the Catholic Church. At that time, he's actually running out of money. Dubois uh, was not very good with his finances. He knew how to spend a pretty penny very quickly. Mm -hmm. He had a French butler, a French chef that he hired in New Orleans, a secretary from France, two enslaved African Americans, and of course that nice furniture that he had brought from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. He was also feeding his horses corn grain rather than hay or grass. So he was blowing through money pretty quick. Mm -hmm. He probably needed to recoup some cost, and that's why he sold the house shortly after its construction began. But he had a deal with Father Odin. He could stay here until April of 1842, until he found somewhere else better to live, or more than likely he was probably hoping for a better assignment probably to a more prominent or wealthy country that wasn't Texas out here on the edge of the world from France. Got it. But before he ever could move in and the house was finished, that's when the drama of the pig war happened. Yeah. Oh. So the pig war. Uh, Dubois, as I mentioned uh, previously, he liked to keep corn grain in the stables of his horses. Well, about three blocks to the east, at the inn that he had stayed at a few weeks or a few months earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the innkeeper, his name was Bullock, no relation to Bob Bullock, his name was Richard Bullock, he used to keep a flock of hogs that he would feed his guests in his inn. But like many Austinites at this time, they didn't fence him in. They just let him wander around town to forage and feed for themselves. Well, they really liked visiting Dubois because he kept that expensive corn feed for his horses in the stables. Mm -hmm. So they kept breaking into his rental property and into the horse stables and eating the horse feed. One day, when they finished off the horse feed, they broke into his rental cabin and chewed on his bed sheets and ate some of his paperwork. Oh. So Dubois became so fed up with these hogs, he ordered his household staff to slaughter them on sight next time they arrived. Sure enough, they came back, and sure enough, they killed a few of them. And that's what really set the rivalry between Dubois and the innkeeper Bullock off to a boil. Now, Dubois started it a couple months earlier when he left the inn. He didn't pay his bill all the way. In fact, he thought he got substandard service and he refused to pay for service he was not satisfied with. So he was already on bad terms with the innkeeper. And when he slaughtered his hogs, that was the final straw. Whenever Dubois uh, would come back into town, Bullock would come out of his inn and start harassing them. You know, their office was right across Congress Avenue, kind of right across where the Driscoll Hotel is on 6th Street. Oh yeah. So Bullock would come out, he'd start throwing rocks at them, he'd chase them around with sticks and clubs. Uh, he beat up Dubois' butler in the middle of Congress Avenue one day when he was walking home with the groceries. When Dubois went into the uh, ground floor of the inn to meet with a Texas politician, Bullock grabbed him by the collar and shook him by the collar violently, threatening his life right there on the spot. So Dubois becomes so fed up with this treatment, he's a diplomat after all, he thought he deserved more respect. Mm -hmm. uh, he pleaded with local and republic authorities to do something about it, but he already stepped on one too many toes at every level, and so nothing was getting done very quickly. And eventually he just gets so fed up with life in Austin, that's when he just leaves the town altogether before this house was finished. And he never actually stayed here. So I noticed the beautiful view of the Capitol right there. That's so rare to be able to see the Capitol, especially from across the highway. How did y'all get that? Well, that is part of our uh, Capitol View Corridor. It's protected by both the city and the state ordinance. Mm -hmm. So here in Austin, all the high rises are located where they're at because they're within these windows of these view corridors that radiate out from the Capitol Dome. 
much like you find in Washington, D.C. with all those prominent monuments as well. Uh -huh. It used to be here in Austin there were height zoning limits as well. The legislature wanted to preserve the dominant view of the Capitol over the Austin skyline, mm -hmm. as it had been when it was finished in 1888. But by the mid-20th century, they realized that was hindering economic development and growth in, in downtown Austin. Mm -hmm. So they switched it out for view corridors instead. And so these view corridors radiate out to either historic sites like here or the State Cemetery three blocks east of us. Mm -hmm. Or sites of scenic beauty like off to the west from Mount Bunnell or all those uh, scenic spots in the hill country as well. So things can be built in the view corridor, but they can't block that view of the Capitol Dome. So this is the Robertson master bedroom. Now, the real history of the home, as we know, the French never really were here. Father Odin and the Catholic Church owned the house for about six years until 1847. But in 1847, Father Odin becomes the first bishop of Texas out of the city of Galveston. Now, of course, he's an Irish, uh, he's a Catholic priest. He's traveling across the state. He's starting new churches and baptizing new believers. Mm -hmm. He never lives in one place for very long. Uh, they thought about uh, starting a school out of this site. But this was the edge of town. The wilderness came right up to the edge of the property here, and no one wanted to send their kids from the safety of downtown Austin around Congress out to the edge of the wilderness at that time. The school never quite happened. Uh, Father Odin rents out the house from time to time. Henri Castro, another Frenchman who founded Castroville, stays here a few nights as he's getting his land grants in the land office for his French settlement mm -hmm. southwest of San Antonio. But the house really isn't fully occupied permanently for those six years. Uh, 1847, Father Odin becomes the first bishop of Texas out of Galveston, and he sells the property to a Mr. Mosley Baker, a veteran of the Texas Revolution, who turns right around and sells it the next year to the Robertson family, Dr. Joseph Robertson. Mm -hmm. And this is where the real history of the house comes from. The Robertson family would own this property for the next 100 years. And they would have at least descendants of theirs living in this house for the next 90 some odd years. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the stories that we're going to try and tell a little bit more of here. Uh, you know, a lot of the articles and books really have focused on Dubois and the French, mm -hmm. but all that history didn't happen here at this site. That happened over in downtown Austin, in what's now West Austin. Dr. Robertson was one of the first medically trained professionals in Austin. He would go on to be the fifth mayor of Austin. He was a very prominent early Austin resident. He had a pharmacy on Congress Avenue. And he had almost 200 some odd acres in what's now uh, East Austin here. So Dr. Robertson had a real connection to the history of early Austin before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Every major event him and his family would have been present at, from the opening of the governor's mansion, to the first stone capital, to the drama of the archive wars in 1842, of, uh, a year after he actually moved in here, uh, or moved into Austin. Mm -hmm. So this was Dr. Robertson's master bedroom. Him and his second wife would eventually raise 11 kids out of these four rooms. Wow. So it was pretty packed. They used every available room for living space in the home. They actually had their meals in that hallway uh, mm -hmm. in the center of the building, the only room big enough to house all their kids at one table at one time. Mm -hmm. And uh, over time, as his children grew up and grew out of the house, there were a few that did stay behind. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Robertson dies in 1871. So he leaves behind uh, his wife and a couple daughters. Some of them are still very young. Uh, one of the daughters, Lily Robertson, stays behind to, to help take care of her widowed mother, and when her mother passes away, she inherits the childhood home. Well, Lily was a preservationist. She was involved in the early founding of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas chapter here in Austin at the turn of the 20th century. She did preservation work out at the State Cemetery, three blocks east of here. She helped move uh, the DRT Museum stuff into the old land office in the 1920s. So it was by the 1920s, she was a widower herself, um, she opens up her house and starts giving tours to the public, calling it the French Embassy. And about 10 years later, when her sister Sarah Robertson, the first child who was actually born here in this room and in this bed, <laughs> becomes a widow herself, she moves in with her sister and they operate tours of their childhood home together throughout the 1930s. Mm. Well, 1939, Lily Robertson passes away late that year and her sister Sarah passes away six months later. And that's when the Robertson grandchildren get the idea to sell this historic house to the state of Texas. And since their aunt, Lily, uh, was an early member of the DRT, the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, they kind of plant the idea in the minds of the state legislature that this place should be run like the Alamo, a state site operated by the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. And so that's where that connection began. But it took about nine years for the house to be sold to the state. It wasn't sold until 1949. Uh, the family wanted more money. The state, of course, didn't want to give more money. Mm -hmm. World War II got in the way, things like that. 
But by 1949, uh, the family is willing to sell the house to the state and they immediately place the DRT as the stewards of this site. And they operated it as a house museum from 1949. The restoration was complete in 1956, all the way into, until 2017. What happened in 2017? The legislature ends their stewardship of the site and transferred it to the Texas Historical Commission. We already operate dozens of historic sites across the state. Mm -hmm. And of course we have archeologists, museum experts, historians, archivists that work for us. And so we kind of restored the house. It was in pretty bad shape uh, with a $1.7 million emergency funds from the legislature for a restoration of the building. Uh, we had a grant from the city of Austin, Preservation Austin, to build out the visitor center with a modern catering kitchen and ADA compliant bathrooms. We finally have more than one bathroom on site now for all our visitors. And um, yeah, part of our program is going to be a little bit more involved with the community and telling some of those stories that previously haven't been told here before. Community engagement room, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to retell and reconnect those stories of the larger history of this site to the East Austin and larger Central Austin community. Some of those stories, of course, are about Juneteenth here in East Austin. And of course, about 25 years ago, we like to joke that about uh, the French came back to the French legation and adopted this site to celebrate French culture and heritage. So the French community here in Austin uh, has come out and they play petanque, which is the French version of bocce ball, out here on our grounds once a week. They hold an annual charity tournament out here. All the proceeds get donated to the site. But they also come out and celebrate Bastille Day, La Fête Nationale Française, sort of uh, France's Independence Day, if you will, uh, out here every July 14th, which has been celebrated here for about the past 25 years. And this it is a petanque game. It's not bocce. It's a French game with a metallic ball, a little bit heavy. And we need to be close of the blue ball, a small piggy pig. And we play here every Wednesday because we love the French aggression and it's a beautiful place to play. Cool. Okay. Okay. So we through this? Yeah. You try to do like me. So I'm going to try to hit that little blue No, ball. no, you need to be close. You know? Close to the ball. You go okay. slowly, slowly, with love. Okay. Up. And you are close. Okay. Come here, come here, come here. Oh, right. Oh, okay. I forget this one. All right. That wasn't very good, Sorry. was it? <laughs> Keep your feet together. Oh, feet together. Okay. That was better. Okay, take more One more. Come here. With Frank, Mike. Huh? Okay, ready? You're you on the ball. More, take more ball. <laughs> you have more? more ball. Try to be close on my ball. That's it. Again, ah. take more ball. One more? Yes. There you go. Right. I think I get worse. Well, <laughs> Be close. Oh, wow. Position, 